Hi, everybody out there in the MIGSO p community. My name is James Lewis. I look after the change management capability working out of London for MIGSO p This is the first of what I hope will be a number of, of really interesting and helpful podcasts for the community, looking at various aspects of our role um, and perhaps giving some ideas and thought leadership as to how to address uh, certain issues which maybe we've been struggling with in our day-to-day roles or we need a bit of support with, or maybe it's something you didn't know you didn't know. We're going to talk about change managing fast and slow thinking today. Now, the usual format for these episodes will be me introducing um, and then uh, I guess a kind of interviewer and an interviewee where the interviewer will pose five or six questions to the interviewee and give them a chance to wax lyrical about um, about the subject of their choice um, and that they feel passionately about and which should add value to us as a community. So um, with that introduction done, uh, the first topic which we're going to go with today is change managing fast and slow thinkers. And I am going to be the interviewee in this case, and so therefore we need an interviewer. And um, I'm delighted to um, introduce my um, esteemed colleague, and, uh, and change management compatriot in the UK, Dominic Young. Hello, Dominic. Hello, Joe. It's great to be talking to you today. It's a great initiative, and I'm proud to be part of it. Could I just kick off, please, and ask to understand, why have you chosen change managing fast and slow thinkers to um, start the podcast series? Uh, yeah, thank you, Dominic. So I guess because it's less obvious... I think there's there's a lot of stuff in change thinking and change management thinking, which which is standard stakeholder management, change impact assessments, sorting the training out, communications planning and all of this. But sometimes when we actually go into that, that standard change journey, we leave people behind who perhaps don't think quite the same as everybody else. And I think fast and slow thinking is a good example of that. And I think it's also important because as an organisation, MIGSO P-Cube pride themselves on tailoring their solutions to the client, on not doing a one size fits all and taking into account the fast and the slow thinkers into an organisation and how we're going to deal with them both differently, I think is a really important part of the, uh, the process of listening to the client's requirements and tailoring what we do to fit those. Interesting, interesting. And if we weren't to do that, what what do you think are the pitfalls for today's leaders um, in not taking the whole fast and slow thinking concept into account? Well, that's an interesting question, Dominic. Um, I think um, leaders tend, and not exclusively, but they tend to be quite an extrovert community and they're often quite fast thinkers they need to be to be able to think on their feet to deal with um, changing circumstances changing requirements and so that means sometimes that the majority of leaders who are fast thinkers don't have a natural empathy with the slow thinking community and perhaps I should explain exactly what fast and slow thinking is before I go any further Um, so Fast thinkers are people who um, who love to kind of like react immediately. Um, they love brainstorming sessions. If they're given a challenge, if they're given a problem, they've already written five or six post-its in about two minutes, stuck them up on the board, ideas to actually address it. And, and they love to, the, the, the back and forth of discussion and debate and, um, and forming their ideas and, um, and solutions on the hoof. Slow thinkers don't like any of that. It makes them feel quite uncomfortable. They like to be given an idea, Um, or some instructions or a problem to solve and they like to go away and they like to think about it quite deeply and it takes quite a lot of time but what you get from a slow thinker is a very carefully formed solution or some um, thoughts or some ideas which are product of genuinely quite deep thinking so you can see that both kinds of thinking have have terrific strengths and have a lot to add, but they are different. And to actually get the best of both of those people, you have to um, deal with them in different ways. So leaders who are largely fast thinkers sometimes don't particularly empathise with the slower thinkers. For instance, there was a Harvard Business School exercise carried out where they mixed up fast and slow thinkers together and found that where you did have a combination and they worked well as a team together then you actually got a lot better results so I think from from, from a leadership point of view you want to get the best out of fast and slow thinkers you want them working well together because to have a diverse I suppose a neurodiverse approach to problem solving inevitably leaves you to a richer range of solutions and makes you more effective as an organization so we have to get that balance right 
And that's what leaders have to think about. They have to actually take themselves out of their natural zone of empathy with other fast thinkers and think, how do I bring the slow thinking population into the area where they can provide solutions as well, which have perhaps been more carefully thought through? Uh, so a high degree of cognitive diversity in this respect could definitely generate accelerated learning and performance uh, in the face of what are increasingly uncertain and complex situations. And that's what leaders want to find in their organisations at the moment. I see. That's, that's, that's very interesting. You, you said at the top of this podcast, you rightly pointed out that us at MIGSO P cubed are rightly proud of the flexibility we take in approach to our delivery and one size does not fit all. If you were meeting a fast or slow thinker on a one-to-one -one basis, how would, how would you alter your approach? So with a fast thinker, you can just invite them to a meeting, put the, put the title of the meeting in, and then once they're sat down in front of you, you can tell them what you want and, and then, then they are very happy to actually um, uh, give you some ideas and discuss it with you and wax lyrical with you. And the fact that they haven't had much time to prepare um, is of no great import to them. For slow thinkers, it's completely different. When you're sending out the invitation, when you're setting up the meeting, you need to be giving them a lot of detail about what you're likely to be talking about. You need to be telling them exactly what you're expecting from them in the meeting and give them a chance to consider how they're going to respond, several hours at least, um, and ideally the day before. So I'll give you an example of how this has worked recently. Okay. So Dominic, you will know that we were both uh, scheduled to deliver a presentation at the um, Association of Change Management Professionals uh, Global Conference um, in about a month's time on uh, delivering change into neurodiverse communities. And that's sadly been cancelled during these um, unusual times generated by COVID-19. But as part of the actual information gathering exercise for the um, neurodiversity presentation, I interviewed several slow thinkers. And what I would do, one in particular, and she thanked me for this, I would send out a lot of detail in the meeting invitation about why I was setting the meeting up, why I had chosen them, what we were going to talk about and what I was expecting from them. And when she came in, she said, thank you for setting it out like that. It really resonated with me. And ever since I got up this morning, um, when I was showering and breakfasting and driving into work, I spent that whole time thinking about how I was going to respond to your questions. And now I'm ready. But if you were just given me a two line intro and I'd had to turn up now and now you'd told me all of that good stuff now, I would not have been able to give you anything like um, as detailed an answer to your questions. So I think if you encapsulate it, give them time to think about it in advance, ideally 24 hours. Let them do their slow thinking before the meeting so that when they come to the meeting, they're ready. Okay, that's good. So we've covered how to deal with diversity there on a one-to-one -one basis, but as everyone knows, when we sit in a room full of people, we, we're going to have a, a diverse mixture within the room. How would you differ your approach in terms of running training sessions and workshops so that you can ensure that both styles of thinkers are, are catered for equally? So I think there's a similar point to one I made in the one-to-one -one in that the, uh, the agenda needs to be sent out in advance and needs to be clear and exactly um, what we're going to talk about and when. Uh, so slow thinkers, uh, they don't like to be forced to interact without actually having due warning of it. So for instance, slow thinkers tend to um, get very uncomfortable in icebreaker situations uh, where they kind of have to think of uh, free uh, weird things that nobody knows about more already and um, and be prepared to kind of talk for like five minutes about themselves at no notice um, fast thinkers love that you also I guess if you're doing the kind of standard brainstorming stuff where you're sticking post-it notes up on a uh, up on the board actually give people permission to put those post-it notes on an hour or two later if needs be so actually actually acknowledge the slow thinkers and say right so we're going to send 20 minutes now but if you're the kind of person who likes to think these through quite carefully, then just, you know, just put one or two up in the next 15 or 20 minutes. But feel free to go and put more post-it notes up on the board later on in the morning, as and when the ideas are fully crystallised in your head. I've got another interesting example about um, how personally I've changed the way I've run a workshop to um, accommodate slow thinkers, because quite often... Uh, you'll be running a workshop, but you may be running it for certain role type. And certain role types seem to um, attract more slow thinkers than others. So, for instance, a lot of 
technical roles and engineering roles where you need quite a lot of deep thought to actually uh, work through problems in the way you do things tends to attract a slower breed of thinker. And a couple of years ago, I was asked to run a workshop for a, um, a community of people whose roles meant that they definitely likely to have a very high percentage of slow thinkers in that group. And I was brought in specifically to tailor my style, which is normally quite passionate, uh, quite articulate, quite a lot of running around the room, and tailor that to actually this particular group. So this is what I did. They sat in a semicircle, um, and I sat down. I didn't stand up. I didn't want to do anything which would make them feel that they were going to be put on the spot at all. I then gave me each a number as we went around the room between 1 and 20. And I said, right, what's going to happen is my colleague next to me here is going to present certain slides, and then you're going to be asked to comment on them. But I'm going to ask you to comment on them in the same sequential order each time. So as he's going through the slides, you can be thinking what you're going to say, and you will know exactly when you are going to be asked to comment. And, and that worked well with the slow thinking population. And it ended up being a, a surprisingly uh, successful workshop. And I think that if I'd, if I'd done it in a more interactive, off the cuff, passionate, standing up, articulating things kind of way, then I don't think it would have worked as well. Right. Thank you for that. I guess I just have one remaining question to, to sort of wrap this up with. But um, you've, you've talked about the different styles of thinking and you, you've talked about how we would tailor our approach there. How could we know or how do we know in advance who is a fast thinker and who is a slow thinker? Yeah, well, I mean, that's an, that's an excellent question to finish off on. Uh, Dominic, and a lot of people probably have been listening to this saying, yeah, this is all very well, but how do I know who's fast and who's slow? And I think all of us, not just change managers, but people in, in the vast majority of um, delivery roles within MIGSOP Cubed, um, will be working with people a lot of the time, will be working on programs and projects. And as part of that, there will be a, a kind of mobilization phase um, where you will be sitting down with a lot of your stakeholders and, um, and understanding what their hopes and fears are and how they operate and what makes them tick. And I think it's at that stage, through those conversations, starting to understand their personality and how they like to operate. And the um, MIGSO P-Cubed uh, stakeholder management tool actually lends itself very well to uh, recording people's specific requirements in terms of how they like to be communicated with. So I think it's in those early stages of setting up your program or project or the change which you're trying to run through, when you're starting to actually isolate and analyse um, your stakeholders, that's where you can draw your own conclusions, whether they're fast or slow thinkers. What happens at the moment is you're having those conversations, but you're probably not thinking about it in those terms. Um, and I think if you think about fast and slow, that will probably inform how you deal with them, um, how you set up your one-to-ones, how you set up your workshops. And by doing that, then you are much more likely to engage these people, to make them advocates of what you're wanting to do, to create a coalition for the change you want to push through, and to make your projects and programmes more successful. James, that, that is really interesting. There's a lot of stuff there to think about. I'd just like at this point to um, thank you for taking the time out to share your knowledge and wisdom with us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dominic. And that concludes the, um, uh, the first of our podcasts. So thanks to Dominic and also thanks to Charles Wilman, who is our sound engineer and editor. We look forward to presenting you uh, the next one very, very shortly. Um, and, and I think this hopefully will be um, the first of a, of a fairly long running series. Have a good day, everybody.